Madam Mubarak and good evening uh, for everyone. And thank you all for attending our webinar today, our special webinar uh, that, um, that we'll have uh, during the current circumstances, unfortunately. As the whole world is experiencing this epidemic, it, hard lessons have been learned in healthcare as the whole world was in slow uh, and painful shutdown. However, as we all know, COVID cannot stop cancer and cancer care will continue regardless of what's going on. So uh, that's at uh, SOPA, we uh, thought that uh, it's important to share everyone's opportunity on managing cancer patients during the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, it was so generous from our panelists and presenter today that they agreed in this short time and during those hard times uh, to um, be with us today. So prior to starting our session, uh, please make sure that uh, all of you guys uh, ask questions down in the Q&A uh, part of the chat. Uh, and we will start our session today uh, with uh, welcoming our speaker, uh, Dr. Mansoor Khan. Dr. Khan is a senior clinical pharmacist of hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplant at KMAC Jidda National Guard Health Affairs and clinical assistant uh, professor at uh, K, uh, King Abdulaziz University. He will talk us, to us today about providing pharmaceutical care to cancer patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. He will share some operational and treatment strategies. Uh, Dr. Khan, please share with us your screen and uh, you're welcome to start. Please join me to welcome Dr. Khan. To everyone, thank you for joining this webinar. And uh, first of all, I would like to say thanks to uh, Dr. Majid Shamrani, Dr. Noura, and all the organizers of SOPA for arranging this much needed uh, webinar. Uh, as we know, that uh, we are going through this pandemic crisis where our cancer patients are the most vulnerable patient after the elderly patient population who are, uh, who are the highest for the severe illness in COVID-19. Uh, uh, the cancer patients are more vulnerable to uh, contract the severe COVID-19 disease because of their low immunity, um, their comorbid uh, conditions, uh, advanced age, um, and so many other factors. So it was much needed to have this kind of webinar where we can agree uh, on uh, a certain uh, recommendations to implement it across the country uh, uh, in order to minimize the uh, 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 visits of this cancer, uh, visit of this cancer patients to hospitals in order to minimize the risk of exposure to uh, COVID-19. So I don't have any conflict of interest related to the contents of my presentation. These are my objectives. We'll describe infection prevention and control uh, during healthcare uh, where, when a COVID-19 patient is suspected to arrive in the hospital with the guidance from the WHO. We'll briefly touch upon a clinical presentation of COVID-19 and risk factors for the severe illness of COVID-19. Uh, we'll uh, briefly talk about the general principles of managing cancer patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, I would like to appreciate uh, Dr. Majid Shimrani and uh, other um, uh, experts of SOPA uh, who came up with uh, beautiful recommendations, uh, practical recommendation or practical strategies for managing cancer patients during the COVID-19. We'll discuss these practical strategies in detail, which actually delineate uh, the strategies, how can we minimize the risk, uh, the visits of the cancer patients to oncology center in order to uh, uh, minimize their exposure to COVID-19 in order to mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19. And lastly, would like to uh, make uh, yourself and myself familiar with the CDC guideline and ASHV checklist for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians to protect ourselves in uh, outpatient care setting. First of all, I would like to um, take your attention on this picture. If you look at this picture, it was taken on 24th of February, which is like two and a half months ago. And... Um, uh, the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, in the world was 79,000, and most of the cases were actually in China. 77, almost 78,000 cases were reported in China and the rest of the world. For example, North America, there were very few cases, nine cases in Canada, 35 in the United States, and few cases in Europe. And most of the cases were actually in, in, in China at that time. So this was a study published in JAMA last week, and they reported how the Chinese were able to overcome uh, this uh, epidemic. It was an epidemic at that time. 
blamed it on it became pandemic. So in the beginning, on the January 1, when actually this uh, uh, COVID-19 started, uh, there was no intervention, there was no lockdown, so this curve started growing up. And uh, by the second week, uh, there was massive migration uh, within the cities, across the border from China to China, uh, without any strong intervention, so the curve started growing up. And then from the third or fourth week, the Chinese government they started pushing massive lockdown, traffic suspension, and home quarantine. And as a result of that, uh, those strong interventions, you can see there's a steep fall of the curve and all the way down to the March 8th. So we can, uh, you can see like in last uh, two and a half months, there have been only 4,000 new reported cases of COVID-19 in China. In contrast to the rest of the world, which was uh, we, uh, we didn't see any cases like two and a half months ago. It's all orange and red uh, in North America and the Europe and total number of cases approaching almost 4 million and almost 40 million people have died actually from this devastating disease. As we know that German to German spread is the common uh, uh, mode of transmission of uh, uh, COVID-19. So what happens, a COVID-19 patient, when he gets infected, he has the COVID-19 in his uh, respiratory secretion. So whenever he uh, coughs or sneezes or even talks, uh, this uh, COVID-19 is uh, released into the respiratory droplets and then it's expelled out in the air and stays in the air for some time for, for a few minutes. And actually it can travel some distance as well, like two meters or six feet. So for that reason, uh, CDC um, uh, gave the recommendation um, uh, first week of April that uh, all, all people need to wear the mask where the social distancing is not possible. So that really tells us like how important is infection prevention and control uh, practices and we need to be familiar with the uh, appropriate infection prevention and control practices, especially when a COVID-19 patient is suspected to arrive in the hospital. We have the guidance from the WHO the WHO recommends to apply the standard precaution for all the patients, which of course include the hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and the use of appropriate PPE according to the risk. But one of the most important things is the early detection, early um, recognition and segregation of the suspected cases. What happens, so for example, if a patient comes in and we don't know whether the patient is, uh, is uh, positive or negative, and if this patient uh, is not properly triaged and is not properly isolated according to the risk scoring system, actually I'll share with you our risk scoring system for uh, acute respiratory infection. And based on that, we can isolate the patient. If you don't isolate the patient, this patient gets spread the infection to other healthcare workers and other family members and other patients. So the key to the success is early recognition and the source control. And uh, if the patient is suspected, not yet confirmed, but patient is undergoing a certain procedure, which are either so generating procedure, for example, if somebody is doing bronchoscopy or nasopharyngeal swab, in that case, WHO recommends to use empiric addition precautions, which is uh, more than wearing the face mask, like you have to wear the uh, N95 mask and goggles, head covers, etc. WHO also recommend implementation of the administrative controls, uh, uh, which is quite broad spectrum. It begins with the provision of the adequate training for the healthcare workers, then they need to be aware of the infection pre uh, prevention and control practices, and they need to be complied with it. And the WHO also recommends to have optimal uh, patient to staff ratio. We should not be overstaffing, we should not be understaffing. In National Guard Hospital Jeddah, what we have done with, uh, uh, we have postponed some elective procedures uh, we have uh, uh, started virtual and telemedicine clinic, and with the help of that, we were able to reduce the number of patients visiting the hospital by 40 to 50 percent. And likewise, what we have done at the administration, they have reduced the workforce by 50 percent. For example, uh, we as a clinical pharmacist, we visit we go to a hospital three, four days, and then we stay home three, four days. Actually, we're not off from the work. We have the remote access. We can see the patient. We can verify the chemotherapy orders. We can uh, see the patient. We can give up a recommendation, but actually we don't go to hospital. So we go to hospital three, four days, and then we stay at home three, four days. It's like we are on call. So with, the, with this approach, we are able to reduce the number of uh, people visiting the hospital and reduce the, uh, reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19. And WHO recommends to establish a surveillance process for acute respiratory infections potentially caused by COVID-19 among uh, the healthcare workers. And also it ensures, uh, uh, it, it recommends to ensure that healthcare workers and the public understand the importance of promptly seeking medical care. 
company also recommends to use environmental and engineering control. And of course, uh, everybody is aware of that. Those who are working in the operation, like maintaining the six feet uh, distance or social distancing, that's really important. And then try to make sure adequate ventilation in all the areas and uh, environmental clean cleaning, which refers to the housekeeping, could be done appropriately. This was the form that I wanted to share with you, uh, which is acute respiratory infection screening form for adults in pediatrics. We have it in our hospital. If a patient comes to our hospital, so we have to fill this form, uh, and it has part A and part B, and um, uh, is, uh, the part A is the clinical symptom, and the part B is the risk of the exposure to MERS or COVID-19. So each uh, parameter has uh, points, and if the score is more than four, then this patient is... Uh, uh, is more likely to have acute respiratory infection and we isolate the patient and we do not discontinue the isolation until the patient is uh, uh, PCR negative for COVID-19. So this was I was referring to that uh, because uh, this virus behavior of this virus was uh, uh, known in the uh, first week of April that it can travel some distance and stay in the air. It was recommended to wear the face mask in the public setting where the social distancing is not possible. There is another myth. Uh, I have uh, been contacted many times by many people like, can we take hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine as a prophylaxis? And I saw this in, in tweet, Twitter and social media. So, well, there is no recommendation to use chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. They are not recommended by any international agency and they have their own untoward effects. I think everybody is aware of the clinical presentation of COVID-19 and incubation period is typically 14 days uh, from the earlier studies from China. We found like symptoms may appear in four to five days and some other studies have shown that symptoms may appear in, uh, in ten, after 10, 11 days. Well, we have seen like most of the patients in uh, our country are asymptomatic patients. And they typically present with cough, fever, fatigue, and rapid shortness of breath, to introduction and mild GS. But uh, we have seen a couple of patients who had like uh, very vague uh, symptoms. They had no fever, no cough, no other uh, presentation, but they had just the alteration of uh, sense of taste and sense of smell, which is now reported also one of the presentation or symptoms, signs and symptoms of the COVID-19. They had no other, other symptoms. So when we tested them, they were positive. These are the risk factors for severe illness. Um, age is single most uh, uh, significant, uh, strongest risk factor for severe illness as we have learned from the uh, mortality rate in uh, Italy. Italy is very well known for its uh, elderly patient population. And I would can say, uh, go all the way down to cancer. The cancer patients are very vulnerable patients to contract COVID-19 and whenever they contract, they can have the severe events. And then the other risk factors are cardiovascular disease, prior stroke, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and medications against ACE and ERP. Well, there's a myth about ACE uh, and ERP that uh, they can um, uh, uh, they can hypothetically um, increase uh, the severity of the COVID-19 disease uh, because um, of the fact that ACE and ERP they can increase the expression of angiotensin converting enzyme two, which is uh, used by um, uh, COVID-19 as a receptor to enter into the host cells. Well, there have been no data which suggests a link between ACE inhibitor or ERP with the worst COVID-19 outcome. So therefore, American Heart Association and Heart Failure Society of America and American College of Cardiology, they have released their statement clearly recommending continuation of these drugs for the patient or already receiving them for heart failure, hypertension, or ischemic heart disease. Although I know many of my friends, they um, were on uh, either ACE or ERP, so they have uh, uh, shifted them themselves to other antihypertensive medications. The same is the story with the NSAIDs. Now let's move to the, um, the topic of our webinar, which is COVID-19 and cancer. Uh, from the earliest studies from China, we found that uh, the mortality rates in uh, cancer patients uh, when they contracted the COVID-19 was nearly 6%. There was another study published in JAMA which showed that those patients who had uh, cancer and when they contracted COVID-19, they had more severe um, events such as admission to ICU and uh, they required ventilation and more people actually died. There was another study published in Lancet Oncology, uh, which uh, actually compared two groups of patients, COVID-19 patients. Patients, those who had no cancer, 
versus the patient those who had cancer. And, th and they included among the cancer patients those who had active cancer and those who were the cancer survivors. And you can see there's a clear spread of the curve. So those patients who had cancer, uh, including active cancer and the cancer survivors, they had higher probability of the severe events, which is ICU admission and uh, requirement of um, and ventilator support and, and the death versus those patients who were not cancer. So that tells you that the cancer is significant uh, for sweetness of the COVID-19 disease. So why patients are um, um, a risk factor for severe COVID-19 disease because of this uh, uh, risk factors. Uh, most of the cancer patients, they are uh, immunosuppressed after receiving chemotherapy, the neutropenic, the, the lymphopenic, and transplant patients, uh, 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 those who are taking graft versus host disease, uh, prophylaxis, uh, treatment, or steroids, uh, they, are, they will be immunosuppressed. Most of the patients have advanced age, poor performance status, and have organ dysfunction, and many of them, they have uh, uh, comorbidities. So that's, these are the risk factors which may again, the cancer patient vulnerable to contract severe COVID-19 disease. Now let's move to the management of cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Um, one of the most important things uh, um, which most of the international oncologists have emphasized on is to have a multidisciplinary approach and to have an uh, open dialogue between healthcare providers and the patients. But one of the most important things that we really need to uh, uh, really need to do or really need to exercise is to see uh, uh, to, uh, the risk of delaying chemotherapy versus the harm of COVID-19 infection. So we need to really balance this risk and evaluate whether if we delay chemotherapy, is it more risky than uh, patient contract COVID-19 and the harm of uh, contract COVID-19? is more than uh, the risk of delaying chemotherapy. So this is up to the oncology physicians and we can also participate uh, collaboratively with the physician in order to uh, calculate this risk. So we'll talk about that uh, when we come to the recommendation from the platform of the SOPA, we'll discuss these in details. But whatever decision that we make, we are delaying chemotherapy because we are con concerned about the harm of COVID-19. We have to discuss these, uh, these uh, plans very well with the patient and caregivers, and we have to be very fair and transparent in making our decisions. As I said earlier, that, uh, because of this pandemic uh, crisis uh, of COVID-19, so International Oncology Societies, NCCN, ASMO, ASCO, their experts, uh, they have published their guidance, insights, and advices. How can we provide the optimal care um, uh, to cancer patients in this COVID-19 pandemic crisis? I, I would not say optimal care, because optimal care refers to the traditional oncology care, which is the pre-pandemic uh, uh, oncology uh, care, that's not possible. And I'm not optimistic that we're going to go back to uh, additional oncology care um, anywhere before six months. Uh, maybe it will take more. So our new normal is uh, uh, what we are going through right now. And uh, we need to really establish our new normal for our country and platform uh, oncology assembly and uh, uh, and us um, with normal for to provide uh, the best uh, possible oncology care to cancer patients. I really like uh, the approach of COVID-19 resources from NCCN guidelines. Um, uh, NCCN guidelines, they provide you a series of uh, recorded webinars um, uh, under American Cancer Society COVID-19 and Cancer Eco Series. And there are some live webinars. I have attended one of them. Um, I have attended this, re re this recorded webinar. These are very helpful. The last one was May 5. And they also have recorded webinars uh, for caregivers. And they also have some courses, uh, which is free. It does not require any uh, fee for that. And uh, uh, the courses will make you um, able to, how to uh, this, uh, you will be able to learn how to talk to patients about cancer treatment, risk factors, and treatment suggestions during the COVID-19 pandemic. The other thing that I like guideline uh, is that they have provided site-specific uh, uh, 
cancer recommendation, uh, treatment of cancer recommendation, site-specific uh, uh, cancer treatment recommendation, and these are the cancers that we have the site-specific recommendation from the NCC and guidelines. Uh, we have the recommendation for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, melanoma, non-melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, prostate cancer, and there are recommendations for T-cell and primary cutaneous lymphomas as well. I'll take an example of uh, uh, breast cancer. So NCCN has recommendation for prioritization of the treatment and trial of the breast cancer patient during the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So they have categorized patients into three categories, the category A, B, and C. Category A includes those patients who are uh, in life-threatening situation, uh, they are clinically unstable and completely intolerable. And in this patient population, we cannot delay uh, cancer therapy in COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So these are our priority, and these patients should be treated as soon as possible, and their treatment should not be delayed. Then there is category B, um, NCCN belief the most of the patient more into this category. So these are the patients who, who do not have immediately life-threatening condition, uh, and we can temper our delay chemotherapy for some time, for example, for two months, three months. It cannot be indefinitely delayed until the end of the pandemic. And then we have the uh, C category. Um, uh, these are the patients who uh, are stable patients. For example, those patients like early breast cancer, um, I'm not talking about triple negative breast cancer or positive breast cancer. Um, for example, look at um, uh, early stage breast cancer with no lymph node positive disease, and they have pathological complete response after the end of chemotherapy and after the surgery, there's no residual disease. So these are the patients, uh, probably we can wait uh, until the pandemic is over, and that would not adversely uh, affect and the outcome if uh, we give them chemotherapy. Similarly, uh, more guidelines, uh, that they provide a lot of information and guidance, and these recommendations should be used as guidance for prioritizing various aspects of cancer care in order to mitigate the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic on management of cancer patients. Now, move to uh, our specialty, which is pharmaceutical uh, uh, services during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, I think everybody knows that pharmacists are the frontline soldiers. Um, they are fighting against the COVID-19 on the borders um, because they are the most accessible healthcare providers. And even in the New York City, the governor of New York has uh, authorized the pharmacists to uh, even test uh, the COVID-19 patients. Uh, so, therefore, we should understand the epidemiology of COVID-19 and uh, the best uh, and appropriate infection prevention and control uh, practices. And we have all this uh, uh, ASHP COVID-19 resource center is there. We can get a lot of information from there. And actually, there's a lot of myth and misinformation about uh, COVID-19 surrounding around the globe among the people. And uh, we as a pharmacist, as we are access ex uh, readily accessible to the public, so we can uh, we can develop healthy beliefs in, among the customers or patients. We can uh, develop healthy behaviors among the patients and educate them um, uh, to adopt the best infection prevention control practices. And uh, we can tell them to stay home, stay safe. And by this, we can mitigate the negative impact of uh, COVID-19. So in the, when we talk about pharmaceutical services to cancer patients, we have three different roles. We have clinical role, the role of the clinical pharmacist. And we have operational role, which is the distribution of drugs. And we have then administrative role. So we'll talk about them one by one. So first, let's talk about oncology clinical pharmacist role in COVID-19 pandemic crisis. We know the uh, the job description are the role of the clinical pharmacist in oncology um, and traditional oncology care. And the same, uh, actually, this uh, this the. Uh, this role is even more uh, pronounced and obvious in, in this pandemic, that we attend a round with the multidisciplinary team. We um, uh, involved uh, in, a, in the direct patient care, we provide patient education, and uh, we provide um, our recommendation to the uh, 
uh, medical team, and we help in, cl in clinical decision making. And actually, we work as a bridge between the oncology physician and the operational pharmacy for a number of reasons. And uh, because of this pandemic uh, uh, crisis, uh, we are working very collaboratively with oncology physician to develop alternative treatment plans and strategies to reduce the cancer technology centers during the COVID-19 break. Not only this, we also have uh, some critical shortage of uh, oncology medications in the country because of uh, travel ban uh, restrictions uh, on custom import and export restrictions. So we have a lot of uh, issues with the shortage of medications. So we have to think about alternative strategies for that reason. We are working very collaboratively with the oncology physician and, and we are working, uh, acting as a bridge between the oncology physician and the operational pharmacy. So I would like to hear um, Appreciate uh, Dr. Majid and uh, the organizers, uh, uh, the experts of the SOPA. There were around 12 experts of SOPA who um, uh, came up with this idea to, um, uh, to list the practical strategies in order to reduce the cancer patients' visit to oncology center during the COVID-19 pandemic, as the cancer patients are more most vulnerable patients to contract severe COVID-19 disease. And I would really like to appreciate all those experts who participated uh, in writing this paper. This paper is uh, ready and it will be submitted to one of the peer review journals very soon and it will be published and that will be a great guidance not only for this country but also for the whole region, inshallah. So we had eight recommendations uh, uh, in this paper and uh, the first recommendation is about delaying adjuvant chemotherapy within the recommended range of treatment initiation. There's no doubt about the usefulness of the adjuvant chemotherapy. It reduces the disease progression and improves the overall survival. Well, there's still a debate about timing of uh, starting adjuvant chemotherapy. So from the platform of the SOPA, we have recommended delaying adjuvant chemotherapy for a maximum of 12 weeks in early stage breast cancer. Uh, of course, excluding triple negative breast cancer that had positive breast cancer as they have the prognosis and delaying uh, adjuvant chemotherapy in these patients at the detrimental effects. And for colorectal and gastric cancer patients, um, uh, the uh, adjuvant chemotherapy should not be delayed more than two weeks, two, uh, two months. The second recommendation uh, uh, from our scope platform uh, was uh, to extend the dosing schedule of cancer therapy. As I mean, uh, there are a lot of examples that we have listed in our paper, but I'm discussing only a few of them because of paucity of time. Uh, we know immune checkpoint inhibitors like nivolumab and pembrolizumab are used quite commonly in many indications in cancer patients. So the huge number of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we thought about um, uh, extending the um, uh, schedule of nivolumab. 40 milligrams every two weeks and uh, 200 milligrams every three weeks. So uh, the other union as well as uh, US FDA uh, nivolumab to be used at 480 milligrams every four weeks and pembrolizumab as 400 milligrams every six weeks. So we recommended uh, switching all patients on monotherapy nivolumab and pembrolizumab to 480 milligrams every four weeks and 400 milligrams every six weeks respectively. Our examples are toxins, uh, as uh, we have seen in our clinical practice, uh, most of the physicians, they use uh, tocitaxel and paclitaxel weekly. Use of uh, paclitaxel weekly had uh, an improved overall survival, uh, but as the overall survival weekly, but because of the benefit and the overall survival in uh, weekly paclitaxel, many people are using actually weekly paclitaxel. Uh, although there was no difference in docitaxel three weekly versus weekly, uh, however, uh, from the platform of the SOPA, we are recommending to use uh, taxins uh, uh, Q3 weekly in order to minimize the risk of uh, uh, the visits of the cancer patient with the oncology center. Um, the bone modifying agent for the bone test is uh, there was one CLGB trial uh, which compared azolidronic acid 4 milligram every 28 days versus every 12, uh, 12 weeks. Uh, there was no difference in terms of physical related events. So from the SOBA assembly, we have recommended to use uh, uh, zoledronic acid every 12 weeks uh, instead of every uh, four weeks. Uh, some patients can be switched from zoledronic acid to inosimab, and inosimab can also be used every 12 weeks. Then we have LHRS analogs um, like uh, lupulite, um, uh, uh, triptotaline, uh, 
get approved as once monthly or once every 20 days or once um, uh, every three months and once every six months. So we are recommending to use HRS analog every 12 weeks um, uh, or even every six months uh, for breast and prostate cancer. Although this recommendation is uh, mainly for prostate cancer, but because of this pandemic, we're also recommending this for breast cancer. Our recommendation is uh, to switch from intravenous chemotherapy or subcutaneous draft of administration, and there is great guidance from from IV therapy to chemotherapy. There are some concerns of switching uh, to oral chemotherapy. Oral chemotherapy is uh, the compliance of this patient, especially those who have uh, uh, on portal public uh, pharmacy, but with our education, if you show them and we can try to mitigate this and uh, oral chemotherapy is definitely going to reduce their uh, uh, number of visits to the center. So, for example, like not only top of side, but when you use the top of side, you have to have the availability of different types that have been and be used in five flurries. And there are many other examples like cyclophosphate. Mm -hmm. The part B of the recommendation three is switching from intravenous chemotherapy to subcutaneous route of administration. The great examples uh, which saves infants and a lot of time is uh, rituximab subcutaneous, which saves infants and a lot of time. And daratumumab subcutaneous have recently been approved by US FDA. And other options, the trastuzumab subcutaneous, uh, uh, use of trastuzumab saves infants and a lot of time. And um, even the ASCO, and I'll talk about uh, another recommendation, is medication can be even administered at home if they had no allergy before. So recommendation number four is about home distribution of chemotherapy and supportive care therapy. It's not something new, and uh, uh, there are a couple of studies that I came across. One of the studies was published uh, in Journal of Pediatric Oncology Nursing two years ago, where actually more than 100 uh, parents uh, uh, included in the uh, questionnaire. So they were given training to administer chemotherapy. Initially, these, pa these parents were nervous about administration of chemotherapy at home. Uh, but later on, they were more satisfied. They had less financial burden and they had uh, less disturbance of their family and the children, and um, they liked it, actually, they appreciated that. Uh, nurses uh, to home and administer this uh, uh, chemotherapy. And ASCO is encouraging, American Society of Oncology is encouraging uh, to do home administration of therapy when well, it is feasible. A lot of examples, for example, as a scientist, and um, uh, push chemotherapy, like uh, increasing, and uh, some other medication which can be given to, for example, fibroids, and even people that know about trastuzumab or spontaneous rituximab to be administered at home with uh, specialized nurses visiting the uh, cancer patients' home. I think sportive care is very easy to be given at home. Um, we can encourage the patient to take the hydration oil, and uh, we recommend to give uh, antimatics orally instead of IV. Growth factors uh, can be uh, taken by patient themselves. And sometimes we have febrile neutropenic patients admitted on the floor who have recovered from the neutropenia. They had bacteremia susceptible to antibiotics or even ESPL. So we can give them once daily or twice daily antibiotics and that can be administered at home. And we had already started this practice before the pandemic and that can be, uh, that can be very helpful actually in this uh, current pandemic uh, situation. For example, if somebody has E. coli susceptible to ceftriaxone, so giving ceftriaxone two gram once daily at home is very feasible. Uh, if somebody has ESPL, SPL and antipenum uh, one gram once daily is pretty feasible uh, in the home setting, and uh, we have been doing it uh, before, even before the pandemic era. We have recommendation number five, which is to delay the stem cell transplant if medically feasible. That's possible in allogenic stem cell transplant patients. Uh, those patients uh, who have, uh, for example, MRD negative disease, uh, ALL patients, and uh, those patients, uh, AML patients, uh, for example, intermediate uh, risk AML patients or single cell myelofibrosis patients uh, who are tolerating the transplant, we can delay their transplant because uh, once they get uh, transplant, they're immunocompromised, they can contract this COVID 19 and 
the harm of the COVID-19 would be much more devastating. And uh, in autologous stem cell transplant, multiple myeloma patients who have very good partial response or complete response, stringent complete response. Uh, these are the patients uh, who can actually wait on uh, Hodgkin disease patients who have uh, metabolic complete response after receiving salvage chemotherapy, particularly these days we are using parentoximab with all and immune checkpoint inhibitors, and many patients actually go into a uh, metabolic complete response um, uh, after doing the PET scan. So those are the patients who can wait actually until this pandemic is over. Recommendation number six is the activation of the telemedicine. I think this is the hot subject. Everybody around the globe, they have uh, started somehow the telemedicine in their countries and the same thing here um, uh, in our hospital and in the country. Uh, many people, they have already started the telemedicine, but that needs really a multidisciplinary uh, team of trained personals um, during this COVID-19 pandemic crisis. It is considered as an essential step to reduce the frequency of visits and possible exposure to the virus. And one of the things that we have done from the platform of the pharmaceutical care service, uh, for example, we uh, have anticoagulation clinic, pharmacists run anticoagulation clinic. We started virtual clinic like a couple of months ago, and uh, we were able to reduce the number of patients visiting the hospital. And uh, uh, this virtual clinic can be uh, activated uh, or can be started for stable patients with those who are on oral chemotherapy, CML, lung cancer, breast cancer, renal cancer, and prostate cancer. And then we have the recommendation number seven, which is uh, to consider intermittent chemotherapy of uh, our treatment discontinuation for eligible patients. I think this is uh, a great approach even be before the uh, the pandemic era, some people have been doing uh, using intermittent chemotherapy in colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and we can uh, we can do the same in the pandemic uh, situation. And some patients, those uh, who are in deep uh, molecular response, for example, CML patient, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia patient who have uh, deep molecular response for more than two years, we can offer them treatment free remission. And actually, one of my resident uh, PTY2 resident, uh, Dr. Fnan, she. Um, have done this study under our supervision, and we have reported the outcome uh, of uh, TFR of uh, more than uh, 90%. Six months TFR was more than 90%, which is the highest ever TFR reported ever in the world. Um, and uh, those people who have TFR of six months, they tend to continue this treatment free remission beyond six months, and our one year TFR is almost uh, similar. 90%. So we can uh, take the consent of the patients and uh, and uh, give them treatment free remission. Uh, I mean, this is a great hope, uh, regardless of this pandemic. I mean, this will help more in the pandemic situation, but regardless of the pandemic, we should continue uh, offering them TFR, uh, CMO patient for deep molecular response. And we have recommendation number eight, which is the operational uh, pharmaceutical uh, services. That's uh, about applying innovative ideas to minimize the patient visits to pharmacy. And uh, one way is to send the medication by postal care to the patient houses and use our drive through services that will minimize the risk of uh, exposure uh, of patients as well as the pharmacy personas to COVID-19. And uh, one of the things that uh, we have done and people have, are doing is uh, using the postal carriers, for example, SAMHSA. Um, there are uh, some um, little caveats to uh, um, these poster carriers that they do not have in their default uh, contracts to include the cold chain uh, um, uh, supplier, cold chain transport. So you have to sign um, a new agreement or uh, new contracts with them, which will include the cold chain uh, uh, transport or cold chain storage. Because if you are sending uh, subcutaneous medication or medication which requires the, uh, the temperature control, so then uh, this needs uh, to have other contracts of the cold chain storage. Other thing is to supply more medication to chronic and stable patient, but you have to make sure that you maintain the pharmacy stack, and which is uh, becoming a problem right now in this current uh, pandemic because of the travel restriction and customs and other bans. Other thing is to have collaboration between pharmacy departments and oncology centers. Um, and actually, uh, there should be collaboration not only between the pharmacy department, there should be collaboration between the oncology centers uh, in the country. And one of the examples I would like to quote here, uh, one of the patients from Medina, uh, Dr. Salman Abdali, who is our panelist today here, uh, King Fahd Hospital in Medina. Uh, there was a hair cell leukemia patient, and they contacted with me that they need um, uh, cladribine. And uh, then I discussed the 
with our uh, depression and uh, oncology center, the patient was actually coming to our hospital to get the treatment here. So I talked to Dr. Salman and I asked him, okay, you can keep this patient there and we can send you medication there and you can get the patient uh, treated there because there was uh, travel restrictions to travel from Medina to Jeddah as well. The other thing is to have an activation of 24 hours offline. That's really important. Our on-call service with clinical oncology pharmacists for consultation and communication regarding the use of medications at home setting. We have uh, the multidisciplinary management uh, guideline for COVID-19 um, at King of the Legends Medical City within the Jindana Hospital, which is a broad spectrum guideline. It not only talks about prevention and uh, control of the infection, but also talks about the management of the COVID-19 and also talks about the how can we deliver the adult and uh, pediatric hematology, uh, cancer care, and other specialties. But I would, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about the proper use of the PPE. So we have uh, you know, uh, mentioned our guidelines that those patients were suspected uh, to have COVID-19. We need to, uh, the difference between the suspected and the confirmed is that you can wear the surgical mask for the patient who is suspected to have COVID-19, but you have to wear the N95 mask for a patient who is confirmed uh, with COVID-19, unless you're doing some uh, aerosol generating procedures where uh, you have to have um, uh, empiric precautions as per WHO to wear the N95 mask and disposable glass and the hot covers. So how do we clear the patient if it's suspected and uh, confirmed case? How do we clear uh, from the isolation? So it's isolation, the discontinuation of the isolation is done by the infection prevention and control. The patient who is suspected, he should have a negative COVID-19. And uh, the patient who is confirmed uh, COVID-19, uh, we do uh, every five days, uh, uh, we do every five days COVID-19 PCR and uh, we need to have two negative PCR and then um, MRP, um, man responsible physician or his designee has to document this in the health information system, a note of discontinuation of isolation. Then the infection prevention control can discontinue the isolation and after that patient has to stay, uh, after the discharge patient has to stay, continue the 14 days of home isolation. Some administrative uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, so CDC COVID-19 guidelines um, recommends uh, and advise, uh, advise the staff who are sick to stay home. And for that, um, the administrators should have flexible uh, sick leave policies, uh, which should not be good and should be consistent with the public health guidance. Uh, one slide about the filling prescription. The CDC COVID-19 guidelines, they believe that um, actual process of preparing medication or dispensing is not a patient care activity. But there are a lot of components um, of uh, medication dispensing involves uh, receiving prescription from the patient, which could be paper prescription, or uh, patient counseling, patient education, that may expose the pharmacy personnel to individuals who may have respiratory illness. So for that reason, they need to have, um, uh, they need to uh, wear the PPE, they need to have uh, the same infection prevention and control uh, practices. And in addition to that, uh, workplace guidance, pharmacy staff should provide the hand sanitizer and counters for use by customers and have sufficient and easy access to soap and water or hand sanitizer for staff. And CDC recommends, I'm reading word by word because it's the CDC guidelines, that so they encourage all prescribers to submit prescription orders via telephone or electronically. The paper prescription should be required. I think in the country, we, most of the hospitals, they have CPOE and online prescribing. Uh, so pharmacies should uh, develop procedures to avoid handling paper prescription in accordance uh, with uh, appropriate state laws, regulation, or executive orders. Lastly, I would like to show you the checklist uh, of ASHP. I'm now going to go into the details of that. I will mention only two points. Uh, the first one is all personal and clinical settings should wear a face mask when within six feet of another person or in a public space, regardless that other person is symptomatic or not. The other thing I would like to uh, focus on is to have a uh, virtual meeting, not face-to-face -face meeting. For example, I'm attending uh, oncology, hematology rounds, I'm attending tumor board meeting, I'm attending pharmacy and therapeutic meeting. So we are doing all these meetings uh, virtually, not face-to-face uh, uh, -face meeting. That will reduce the risk of uh, uh, exposure uh, of um, us to COVID-19. Lastly, we need to have uh, a list of essential medication for the country and for the institution. And uh, WHO published uh, is, uh, is
essential medication list uh, first week of April last year in their meeting held in Geneva. It's a very comprehensive list, uh, 65-page document. So I was contacted by um, uh, American Minister of National Health Affairs, Jeddah, uh, because Saudi FDA contacted with him to provide uh, a list of um, essential medication, oncology list, uh, is list of essential oncology medication uh, from the perspective of the Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. I think Saudi FDA contacted with other hospitals, yes, King Faisal, Ministry of Health, Security Forces, Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs to get, take a feedback of uh, uh, list of the essential oncology medication. So I submitted uh, the list of the essential medication to our oncology and to Saudi FDA. This list includes and this is essential medications for the Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs in the traditional oncology care even before the pandemic. Uh, and Saudi FDA uh, is also looking towards uh, to have a list of medication which we have uh, uh, critical stock issues. Uh, uh, those medication which we have supply issues, uh, we have critical stock issues. So they would like to communicate with the manufacturers to. Um, ask them about uh, extending the expiry beyond uh, use day. And we have provided a list of 40 medications, which is not only in college, but also non college medications as well. And they have contacted with other hospitals as well for the same reason. So in conclusion, um, cancer management is a significant concern during COVID-19 pandemic in all healthcare settings as our cancer patients are vulnerable to contract severe COVID-19 disease as uh, the international oncology societies have uh, emphasized uh, the multidisciplinary approach should be activated with open communication between the healthcare providers and patients and oncology pharmacists should have an active role in maintaining access to cancer therapy and minimize the risk of exposure to COVID-19 and uh, innovative ways and alternative treatment plans should be implemented to combat COVID-19 and uh, we have to be a frontline soldier in this war against the COVID-19 to um, not only save uh, our cancer patients, but also to save ourselves and our families. With that, I would like to thank uh, for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for this amazing presentation. It was uh, very much helpful. And uh, we got some questions here for you uh, from the audiences, if you don't mind. Uh, so I have the first question here from uh, Samah uh, is asking about uh, what's been done internationally for cancer patients who are admitted with fever through the ER. Uh, currently in their institution uh, is isolating them as if they have COVID until they uh, have negative results. Are they, uh, are they at higher risk? Uh, so they've been placed uh, in COVID areas. So I think that's the question. So what are you... Uh, doing uh, when you have a patient who have fever and comes to the ER? So uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, WHO is recommending triage and uh, early identification and we have our guidelines and we are following, we have our actually uh, scoring system, which is acute respiratory infection uh, scoring system. It has two parameters. One is the symptom, the other one is the risk of exposure. So uh, if the patient has fever and uh, has the symptoms, uh, we definitely are going to isolate this patient. Uh, we consider this patient is suspected and there's a WHO guidance. Uh, I began my talk with uh, how to uh, take care of uh, patients uh, when uh, suspected COVID-19 patient arrive in the hospital. So what uh, the patient isolation until the COVID-19 is negative. Perfect, perfect. Thank you for your answer. And I think we are also doing the same exactly in other hospitals too. So there's another question here by Dr. Muhammad Khalid, Omar Khalid. He's asking about, uh, sorry, he's asking about the extended dosing schedule that was, uh, uh, that was approved or supported by insurance or payers. So this is his question. And then second question, please share your experience in terms of any clinical challenges in extended dosing schedule. So what was the coverage, insurance coverage? I think he's asking, is it approved and is it covered? Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, yeah. So there is 
in, in our recommendation, which is going to be published very soon from the platform of the SOPA. So whatever recommendation we have put in our paper, I, I, I included in my presentation. This is not only my recommendation, this is the recommendation of our SOPA. And it is evidence-based. For example, the volume map, 480 milligrams is uh, approved by Indian and it's approved by US FDA. Pembrolizumab, map, for example, 400 milligrams every six weeks, it's uh, approved by EMEA and it's approved by US FDA. And uh, Paclitaxel and Docetaxel, these are approved weekly and these are approved every three weeks. And uh, Luprolite, uh, Triptoralin, these are approved once monthly and these are approved every three months and these are approved every six months. So whatever recommendation which is coming from the platform of the SOPA is all evidence-based and it is backed by um, uh, international approvals uh, from one of the agencies. So all of them, these are evidence-based. So uh, there should be no issue of insurance coverage uh, or funding uh, from any source. So we have another question here uh, in the same topic uh, from Dr. Yusuf Al-Ala. And he's asking about the extending, uh, that he's worried about extending immunotherapy using higher doses that might lead to more adverse events compared to the traditional dosing. So it will lead eventually to more ER visits and then also more risk of COVID-19 exposure. So we should be very cautious. Uh, that's what he's saying uh, in using extended dosing. I don't know if you have any comments regarding that. Um, uh, most of the, actually, uh, I'm not sure about the, um, I think it's very safe. It's approved by EMA, it's approved by it's approved by US FDA based on the pharmacokinetic studies. So as long as uh, the pharmacokinetic studies and pharmacodynamic studies have proven these are compatible schedules, I'm not that much worried about uh, the side effects. Um, however, it has to be tested in randomized control trial fashion uh, to compare these two practices uh, with regards to the safety. But pharmacokinetically and pharmacodynamically, uh, these were compatible. Okay, cool. So the next question, uh, Dr. Ausu Shamsan is asking about COVID-19 vaccine. So if it's gonna get approved soon, will you recommend it to cancer patients and which vaccine type, live attenuated killed viral vector mRNA, uh, you expect uh, will be more hazardous for cancer patients? Well, uh, the vaccine, uh, it's too early to say anything about vaccine right now. Uh, I think uh, the vaccine has been made and it's uh, uh, started in phase one clinical trial in US. Uh, there are two companies uh, which have been registered in US. I think it's gonna take at least 12 months to 18 months. Well, um, uh, of course, uh, I think it's not only cancer patients, all patients on earth are going to be vaccinated. Uh, uh, they're gonna be uh, penalty if somebody is not vaccinated, they will have travel bans, um, even the job, uh, the organization, they will require people to have this vaccination uh, because uh, it's really a devastating disease. And the only way that we can eradicate this disease is the vaccination. Whatever treatment that we are doing right now, we know uh, it's not working. So the only way we can do, we can eradicate the disease is, is the vaccination. So is the cancer patient. So for example, our even post-transplant patients we, we give them vaccination. So, I mean, we have to give the vaccination. So, um, whatever vaccine is available, which is approved by international authorities, international regulatory agencies, uh, will be given to the cancer patients as well. I think, uh, additionally, just want to add that uh, definitely before starting chemotherapy, uh, it's hard to give it once the patient is immunocompromised at that stat. Uh, so, prior to, uh, let's say, uh, chemotherapy or any procedure, or after uh, we're done with actual chemotherapy and so on. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, next question is, uh, and again from Dr. Yusuf, is what uh, COVID-19 oncology pharmacy initiatives and changes uh, will continue with us post-COVID-19? If you want to answer the question now, or we will leave sorry, it sorry, 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 No, it's okay, sorry. Can, can, can you repeat because there was a uh, little echo? Yeah, sure. So they are ask, he's asking about which initiatives that can continue with us uh, post-COVID-19 era. Post-COVID-19 era. Uh, well, um, we have to go back to the traditional care. So pre-pandemic era, which is the uh, traditional care, I was uh, hearing a webinar on NCCN. So we have to wait until this, I think it's not gonna, it's not gonna end very soon. It's gonna take some time, maybe six months, maybe more. Uh, 
But of course, when we go back to the post-pandemic era, uh, we have to go back to the traditional care because what we know the best care model is the traditional oncology care model. And what we are here right now, this is our new normal, but this is not the best uh, possible uh, on oncology care model right now in the, in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. We have to go back to the traditional care model. Awesome. Uh, another question that uh, is asked, and I might just stop over here and try to manage those questions later in uh, our panel discussion, is uh, from Shada Al, -Al, 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 -Al Balawi, and she's asking about a virtual anticoagulation clinic. So how are you following up those patients when it comes to INR? So I would imagine that you're using point of care at home, right? And then patients will tell you the levels and you adjust accordingly, right? No, uh, no, we are not using point of care INR yet in uh, National Guard. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, we had a criteria. So we had criteria that those patients who had stable INR um, uh, for um, three, uh, two consecutive uh, visits, and uh, we have uh, asked them not to come to the clinic and they can just come and collect their uh, refill medication. And uh, those patients who were like MBR, uh, unstable patients, so uh, those are the patients whom we have been asking them to come and have the INR checked and, and properly assessed and then get the medication. This is one thing. Another thing that we have recently started and National Guard Real has already started it. And uh, also in Jeddah, uh, we are, uh, Patients coming from the far flung areas, we are switching from a war frame to a pizza uh, uh, most of the patients. But MBR patient, antiphospholipid syndrome patient, these kind of patients where DOAX cannot be used or pizza cannot be used, are those patients who have hormone hemodialysis or um, uh, uh, gastric cancer patients. So the patients where the DOAX cannot be used, uh, we are using uh, uh, warfarin, but other patients who are switching to a pizza Awesome, awesome. There's a lot of questions over here to you. Uh, I don't know if we have time to answer them since we have a panel discussion later, but uh, if, if you can stick around and we can do it later and answer those questions individually, I would appreciate that, Dr. Amosur. It's okay, no problem. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, okay. Dr. Amosur. You're welcome.